Greetings, shippers. Welcome back. And it's time once more to dive into the realm of Harry Potter. You're a shipper, Harry. We've already talked about Harry Potter quite a few times on this channel. Drury, Dramione, Drapple, Scorbus. It's been a lot. And yes, you heard me. Travel, no ship unturned. So if you missed any of those, you can of course click the cards or the links will be down below. Today we're gonna to be looking at a ship that's had quite the journey and was, and still is for some, one of the beloved Harry Potter ships. We're gonna be taking a look at Lunari, sometimes called Huna and many other names, but we'll get to that. The pairing of Harry Potter and Luna Lovegood. This video was voted for by the lovely folks over on Patreon. They help keep us on track and also to select some pairings that might otherwise have to wait quite a while for their time in the sun. You know how how long things take here. For those who are interested, there is another vote ongoing at the time of this recording. Before we get started, if you haven't already, please do follow on social media to stay up to date, know when we're streaming, and just come on over and chit chat about fandom. It's a good time, I swear. With that being said, Lunari has a fascinating history that spans the release of the Harry Potter series and beyond. It highlights some interesting things about the evolution of Harry Potter fandom and shipping in general. So let's get started. Now a worldwide cultural phenomenon, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series first book, The Philosopher Stone, or Sorcerer's Stone upon its initial US release, was published in 1997 in the UK and 1998 in the US, and rose to become one of the best-selling books by 1999, and found itself translated into 73 languages, a number that would later rise. Harry Potter quickly became a cultural moment, and one that ignited the imagination of many, but particularly youth, especially tweens around Harry's age at the series' start, who would have the opportunity to grow up with the series, creating a dedicated and invested fan base alongside an ever-growing legion of new fans jumping on at various points as the release of the book series itself spanned 10 years, with the final book in the series, The Deathly Hallows, released July 21st of 2007. On top of that, there was an extremely successful film series adaptation that began in 2001, and also concluded a decade later, with The Deathly Hallows Part 2 in 2011, which meant that the film series served as an accent of interest for book fans, keeping them engaged and growing with them, just like the books, while also serving as an entry point for new fans, who may then double back to the book series, though not all did. At the at the same time as all of this, massive shifts were occurring in fandom on all fronts. The digital fandom space was beginning to assert itself, with independent fan pages on the rise, as well as the beginning of consolidated fan spaces, such as fanfiction.net, which was founded in 1998. At the same time, slowly but surely, the way nerd culture was being perceived was beginning to shift, from seedy, obsessed underbelly to cool, and something that could get people engaged in a variety of activities, many of which would later begin to transition into profitable, though it is still far from understood, with most having a surface level comprehension. A special note for Harry Potter, it gained a positive reputation for getting kids interested in reading. So Harry Potter was swept up in many waves. Indeed, it was extremely cool to like Harry Potter, and depending upon where one was, it could even be an act of rebellion. People began to find their fan communities, both in real life and online. As for some, that was a safer and better refuge. In the late 90s, fan fiction was really only beginning to take root on the internet, slowly as some zine makers began to think about digitizing their archives, while other new fandoms began to arise. Harry Potter is often credited with creating the online boom of fanfiction. While it no doubt helped, this spike would have likely occurred anyway, as it was already underway. Indeed, fandoms such as The X-Files, which began in 1993 and galvanized online shipping culture, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which saw a rise in more accessible fandom discourse beginning in 1997, highlight a growing interest in participating in fan culture online. And this is just to name a couple to indicate that the scene was already primed. What Harry Potter definitely did was speed it up due to its massive popularity and wide fan the first Harry Potter fix on FF.net date back to the first book's glory days in 1999. The descriptions indicate the tone of the era. Many have descriptions such as, first attempt, or I just changed a little bit, or don't sue me, or let's just give this a go. As a new generation of fans began to navigate what for many of them was a brand new concept, the idea that stories and adventures they imagined in their head after reading could be transcribed and shared with the world, and that others wanted to read them too. It must also be noted that by 1999, the Harry Harry Potter series was three books in, with a book released a year. In fact, it was only after the fourth book released in the year 2000 that the waiting period between books began to increase. So for a time for early fans, the universe was not only expanding rapidly, but also aging at the same rate as them, which created a unique dynamic, as early fans literally felt themselves to be growing up alongside the characters. It also meant that when the first book surged in popularity, new fans had three books to dive into, and as a result, a lot of people had a lot of ideas about what they wanted to see happen. In the early days of Harry Potter fix, a lot of them were gen. There was a lot of pondering, missing scenes and what have you. However, slowly but surely, romance and shipping began to enter the scene, as fans used Harry Potter to explore a wide variety of things, far beyond who should end up with who. As fans
fans lived out their first crushes, navigated the taboo, burgeoning sexuality, and also began to express their first sense of preferring their own headcanons over canon. A seed that started off small, but would become a huge part of the Harry Potter fandom that continues to this day. All the ships within Harry Potter have unique journeys because of how the series was released, and the longevity and multimedia makeup of the fandom. So with all of that groundwork laid, let's get to Lunari. By the time Book 4, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire was released in the year 2000, Harry Potter fans had a great many things they were excited about, one of which was the course of Harry's love life, on top of adventures he was going to get into, and hopefully the happy family he was going to have. And they also wanted more of the world in any way they could get. Book 4 introduces Harry Potter's first canon crush in terms of the Ravenclaw Cho Chang, who was dating a rival of Harry's in the Triwizard Tournament, the handsome and popular Hufflepuff, Cedric Diggory. While some took to this, they were left to linger and wait in the three-year gap between books four and five, which allowed many new fans to jump on, especially as the first film was released in 2001. This also had given time for original fans to age, and also to hone their fan fiction and art, and general fandom skills, and also for the aforementioned new fans joining the fandom to be made aware that it was active. Especially as in the early 2000s, fandom began to really proliferate and gain online acceptance, as the digital space became an outlet for many, particularly youth. So the audience was perfectly poised for a new pairing, on top of the ones that had already taken root, such as the juggernaut that was Ron Myony preceding its canonicity, long-standing ships such as Drary, or now more controversial ones such as Snary. And with the release of the Order of the Phoenix, Harry found himself with an at the time near uncontested het ship. Though there were of course Hermione shippers, though that would grow with time and the films, and a later statement made by Rowling herself. Instead, many found themselves drawn to Harry and the newly introduced Luna Lovegood, whom he meets on his way to Hogwarts, which also happens to be where he met a good many of his significant relationships. The good ones, at least. He meets his enemies while buying robes, or books. From the start, people were fascinated by Luna, and she quickly developed a firm fan base for many reasons. One, she was in a different house, and fans at the time and to this day were attracted to the other houses as well as Gryffindor, where most of the focus lay canonically, as part of wanting to learn more about the world and the characters that inhabited it. Also, Luna was very different from other characters. She was unique, aloof yet friendly, charming yet off, and seemed to be completely sure of herself, with an ease and confidence that was appealing to many readers, especially for those who felt a little odd themselves. She was also willing to believe and go with the flow, with Rowling describing her as the anti-Hermione. She also shared solo scenes with Harry that placed him in a different light and helped him to see the world a different way, helping him through his problems. Indeed, many of these scenes dealt with intimate themes, not so much in a romantic sense, but just in terms of the depth of the relationship people discussing them tend to have. Luna came off as a light-hearted character, but despite this, she had clearly known hardship, as one of the ways her and Harry bond is through their knowledge of death. In fact, she is the only one who can truly comfort him after the loss of Sirius Black, which also endeared her to many fans, as the loss of Sirius Black was quite a moment in the series when it first occurred. While not in a lot of the book, Luna has a significant impact and is constantly supportive of Harry, and while she is defined, there was also a lot of room left in her personality for fans to play with. Headcanons quickly emerged, where she was a seer, or part nymph, or other magical creature. Fans were also quick to create expansions on the interactions between her and Harry, and they had a lot of time to expand, as they would have to wait two years until the next book. In that time, pairings really began to grow, and Huna took its place as one of the more prevalent amongst the het ships for Harry, and would grow in influence following the release of Book 6, which would introduce the to this day contentious relationship between Harry and Ginny. While that pairing has more shippers producing works at the time of this recording, as new fans experience the series in a new way, all at once, and also with awareness of spoiler slash canon. At the time, Harry and Ginny's romance came out of nowhere for many fans, and there were many debates, particularly between these two ships that still continue. Though with the benefit of hindsight and theories filling in gaps, as well as much fanon, and depending upon how one feels about J.K. Rowling's authorial authority, Ginny has gained ground, and some did love it from the very start. And many fans have sought redemption for this pairing, and the character of Ginny in general. It must be noted that there are of course multi-shippers who enjoy both, as well as a great many other Harry Potter ships. And for a time, there was even a relatively popular OT3 featuring the three characters. But let us dive further into why people ship Harry and Luna. Many shippers gravitated towards the unique understanding these characters shared, particularly striking when contrasted to Harry's other relationships, many of which had been around for longer and were extremely close. Yet there was an ease with Luna, and it went both ways. Despite supporting and believing in Harry, Luna wasn't in awe or intimidated by him, and treated him as she treated anyone else. And Harry, while finding her a little odd, didn't to the same extent of others, even rejecting her moniker of Looney. Indeed, together the two seemed to be able to find a piece that both seemed to need, and fans also enjoyed extrapolating upon future adventures 
characters, many projecting forward into adulthood, a common practice in the fandom. Some felt the characters shared parallels, i.e. both witnessing parental death and it altering their lives, and Luna is one of the first people to tell Harry his feelings are valid, whom he truly seems to believe. Fans were drawn to the small moments that showed what an impact Luna had on Harry. For example, in The Order of the Phoenix, wherein Luna is cheering for Gryffindor at the Quidditch match by creating a rather cartoonish lion to roar in support. Harry could hear Luna's ludicrous lion hat roaring amidst the Gryffindor cheers and felt heartened. Others note later instances, as these two continue to have moments throughout the remaining books. Some shippers felt that Luna's inherent humor could brighten Harry's life, and that her intelligence could be an asset, which combined with her other traits, placed the ship above Hermione for some. Some shippers felt heartened themselves that Harry's genuine compliments seemed to mean a lot to Luna, as highlighted by moments such as this in The Half-Blood Prince. People expect you to have cooler friends than us, said Luna, once again displaying her knack for embarrassing honesty. You are cool, said Harry shortly. None of them was at the ministry. They didn't fight with me. That's a very nice thing to say, beamed Luna, and she pushed her specter specs further up her nose and settled down to read the quibbler. Indeed, Lunari became a pairing wherein fans would search for moments, any snippet of Luna and Harry, and the 2007 release of the fifth film also happened to coincide with the release of the Deathly Hallows final novel. Simultaneously introducing some fans to Luna for the first time, convincing certain non-shippers of the pairing due to visual representation, which can jumpstart some shippers more than text-based material, or reminding people why they had enjoyed the ship in the first place. It also allowed fans to search for slight variances in between book scenes and film scenes, which for some created some moments. The end of the series created a curious ripple effect in the fandom. As pairings aside, not everyone was happy with how everything unfolded in the final novel, though a lot of the critiques do have to do with how certain relationships were handled, romantic and otherwise, alongside the deaths and also the infamous epilogue, which it must be noted some had no problem with. However, many were disappointed in Harry's ultimate merits to Ginny and took refuge in earlier fans and the potentialities that were now relegated to the fandom space. Many liked this pairing because they found the combination of these archetypes interesting, the hero and the dreamer, and they found these two's relationship to be organic, while many found the canonical pairings to be forced or poorly executed. Some felt that the surprise crush reveal that occurred with Ginny in Book 6 could easily and more effectively be transferred to Luna, perhaps in the sequence where Harry asks Luna to Slughorn's ball, a kind of realization of feelings that had already been lingering below the surface, that for many shippers didn't come through with the other plot at the time. Also, there were some who were put off by the idea of falling for one of her closest friend's younger siblings. Mileage very much varies on that last point. Harry protects Luna and feels in sync with her, and she naturally bolsters him. For many, it was a relationship worth exploring, and there were many ship manifestos, these being fans writing their rationales for the ship, most often accompanied by Rex, of relevant or just their favorite fics featuring the pairing. There were also dedicated archives to the ship, both for fanfics and fan art, and just a lot of work produced. Of course, as with many older pairings, at least older in digital fandom terms. Some of these have been lost to deleted pages, unpaid domains, a shift in fan interest, and other factors. Indeed, this pairing has been around so long, it has seen all popular variations of ship name to date, from initials, HP slash LL, H slash L, Harry slash Luna, to conceptual, SS Loonies and Lions, to the modern portmanteaus it now sports. While the ship is still fondly remembered, it is not as popular, and in fact has been overtaken by certain other head ships, such as Hermione or Hinny. Indeed, the Depending upon the site one is on, it will vary whether one will encounter more Hinny or Huna. This can confuse newer fans, as some will ask why Huna is more popular than Hinny. So what happened? How did Lunari move down a bit in ship ranks overall? For those coming to the series now, some of the aforementioned moments may fall flat. It is not uncommon for modern fans to have encountered fandom first, before entering a series, which can color how they engage with it, some even going in with preformed ships and fanons. It is also possible now to go in already being aware of canon and the ultimate outcome which also impacts how one views a work. Binging the series is now possible as well, or at least completing it in rapid succession. And for some, the Luna and Harry moments seem sparse and not worth lingering on, and Hinny feels less rushed when consumed in a burst than with a gap of years. Along the same vein, that excitement and wonder, the what-if factor that was part of what fueled many Harry Potter ships, is no longer present, which again can keep some from gravitating towards it. It must also be noted that Harry was not the only one to garner more interest in other pairings, as Luna's popularity within fandom grew, so too did the variations on pairings, such as Luna and Draco, and a huge one, particularly as the series concluded, was Luna and Neville, with many expressing disappointment that they didn't end up together in canon, especially when it was revealed that Rowling had considered it, but then had deemed that ending too neat, a sentiment many found laughable given the other pairings in the epilogue. Notably, one of the largest femslash ships for Luna is Linny, the pairing of Ginny and Luna. Harry Potter is one of those fandoms where if you can think it, someone somewhere most likely ships it. As always, there were those who felt Harry and Luna 
had no chemistry, or that the relationship was born of pity, or the foundations were built on too much sadness to produce a healthy, lasting relationship. Also, some never took to one or both characters. Mileage varies a lot on Harry, as can be evidenced by how different he is at times in Fanon versus Canon, and some simply found Luna forgettable or irritating, falling into a she's not like other girls box, just the magical fairy pixiest version. A unique complaint for Luna is some fans dislike how much she varies in Fanon, feeling like too many authors take her too far from her base point, just tweaking her to whatever suits their needs rather than working with her character. Of course, some fans get different reads, and with Luna, who is not depicted as often as others, as mentioned, some take more liberties. While it may not be a ship that all new fans flock to, it is still alive and well, with certain original Harry Potter fans still invested and creating for it, and new fans who discover it, if not from the text, then from the fandom, which can sometimes make a stronger case than the text. The Harry Potter fandom is still a very active and passionate one, and discourse is ongoing, and that means there can at times be friction. Kuna, thankfully, is not one where there is too much drama, even if some are confused by the ship. For many, this is a cute pairing with a lot of potential and room for creative fix that can go off in any direction, and there's a lot to check out, with that unique Harry Potter fandom perk of being able to go back to look at fix that were being written as the series unfolded, so one can go see what people were hoping might happen, or how concepts and fix changed. There's a lot of missing scenes, time travels, future fix, and more, and nowadays there are many complex AUs, as people utilize their knowledge of canon, the expanded universe, and more to create many altered pieces. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, dive in and see what the fandom has to offer. Were you a Harry and Luna shipper? Who's your favorite partner for Harry? If you were around while the books and movies were being released, what was your favorite era of fan fiction? Let me know the answer to all of those and whatever else you want to talk about down below. And you know the drill, numbered if possible. I love a good essay comment. As always, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to spend it discussing shipping with me. I always appreciate it. If you haven't already, please do subscribe and hit that bell notification so that you never miss a vid, for there are as always many more videos coming soon. I will see you all again when I can, and until then, let's get that outro. Bye bye This has been Shipper's Guide to the Galaxy. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Special thanks to all of my patrons, names on the side, for helping to make these videos possible. There are, as always, more videos coming soon, so until then, stay tuned, for there are as many ships out there as there are stars in the sky.